In this video, let's test out the V-Ray 7 beta version together and learn about the upcoming new features such as the ability to render Gaussian splats directly within V-Ray, the new Luminaire lights or the new Firefly removal algorithm and much more. So the public beta version of V-Ray 7 for 3ds Max has just been released. That means that everyone with an active V-Ray subscription can join this here for free and test out V-Ray 7 beta. You can get some idea about the new features that you can expect in the final release of V-Ray. So I thought instead of you having to go through and check out those features, let's just go through the most important features in this video here together so you can get some idea of what to expect. There's also this constantly updated thread in the Chaos Forum that lists all of the new additions, tells you how to use them, and it also lists some smaller modifications that have been done. So I will link to this page and the opening page in the description of this video. You can check that out if that's interesting for you. Nonetheless, if you want to join this program here by yourself, you can press this button. It will bring you to the latest nightly builds in here. And just for reference, I'm using at the moment this version here for this video, but later on there will be newer releases with a lot of bug fixes and so on. So just keep in mind, this is a beta version. Stuff is going to change. The stuff that I show you in this video here is maybe not going to be released the same way in the final release. So just that you're aware of that. So one of the biggest new additions is the ability to render Gaussian splats directly within V-Ray. For this, in the V-Ray geometry tab, you can just add this new V-Ray Gaussian geometry in your scene and then just load a Gaussian splat that you downloaded from the internet or that you created manually by yourself. Then you can just open your frame buffer, start the rendering, and you can just move your camera around, for example, to see how the Gaussian splat looks from different perspectives. You can do that all directly with your camera in 3ds Max natively. It renders really fast and looks actually quite nice. You can then add 3D objects in your scene. For example, here I have just a simple teapot prepared. And you can see the Gaussian splat even reflects here in our teapot. So we can use that quite nice to integrate objects into an environment. If we want to, we can also add this shadow catcher geometry. And this basically makes it look like there's some some shadow interaction between the teapot and the Gaussian splat. But the Gaussian splat itself is basically the same like a self-illumination geometry, so it doesn't really react to any kind of light. It can't really receive any shadows unless you put a shadow catcher geometry on top. So that's some limitations that you have to know of if you're working with these kind of Gaussian splats in here. But I think it's really nice addition to have this now in V-Ray. And I can see a lot of nice use cases for this. The V-Ray frame buffer also received some nice updates and one of them would be the polygon region render. So far we had this simple region render where we can just define here a rectangular shape in our scene and then only this part here would be rendered without touching any of our existing rendering. And now we have access to this polygon region render. So with this, for example, we can go in and define a much more complex shape. So let's say we just want to have uh, region here that kind of traces our car paint. We can go in and make quite a detailed shade of this in here. And now we can go in and choose, for example, different colors. And you can see only those parts which are in the region will be updated. I can even go in and choose a new region in here. So you can define different parts of your image and then only those parts that have the region will be updated. And as I said, you can save a lot of render time doing so. Another very nice addition is the implementation of a vignette effect directly in the frame buffer. You can get this by just right clicking here, new layer, vignette. And ideally you want to place this below your tone mapping so that you have the correct kind of colors because this is multiplied on top. So the tone mapping ideally should happen afterwards. Otherwise you can get some weird results. And then inside here by default, I think it looks very strong. I would hope that they would adjust the default settings here a little bit. But anyway, you can go inside here and just move those handles to wherever you want them. And those handles basically are quite nice because you can move this around in your scene here or in your view. And you can define the width and the softness here with this kind of handles. And you can also go in and choose different kind of opacity because I think by default it also seems very strong. But then you can see you can very easily just move around 
and define where you want to brighten your image, where you want to darken that. And by this way, help your viewer to decide wherever is the most important part of the picture. You can guide the viewer's attention to parts in your picture. And I think this is quite nice. Really, really happy that this here now finally comes to V-Ray directly in the frame buffer. And I think it's integrated quite nicely. Another addition has been added to stop your rendering. So by default, if you started your rendering and you just use this board rendering button, once you do this, let's just wait until it starts rendering. So it's now rendering and I just press this button. You can see it just stops wherever it is. There's no post effects, no denoising or anything like this applied. But if I choose a different workflow, let's use the start rendering button again. And now this is rendering. I can now longer click on this button and use this stop rendering button. And once I do this, you can see all the post effects and everything is force applied on the image. So it has all of the denoising lens effects and so on. And you don't end up with a half finished image basically. So I think this one will be my default option from now on in order to stop my renderings. So V-Ray 7 will come with this new light type, which is called Luminaire Light. And the idea of those lights is that it can pre-compute a complex lighting situation into an external file. And with this, hopefully save some precious render time. So for the moment, you can't really create those lights here by yourself, but you have to rely on the Chaos Cosmos library. And if in here you search for everything that has the name tag Luminaire, it will open all of the lights that come with these new luminaire lights. So for this scene I just used two of those lights in here and now let's just go in and start a new rendering and see what kind of result we will get. So this took exactly one minute and three seconds to render on my computer and the whole room is basically lit up just by those two light sources in here. There's only very little light coming from the exterior. So let's just select this light and check out some of the settings in here and you can see it loads here this PLW file that just stores all of the pre-computed data inside. Then you have a bunch of other settings like intensity, color, and that you can affect diffuse, specular, atmosphere, and so on. You know these settings from the standard Vera lights. It's quite similar to those. So now in order to understand what kind of benefit they bring to us, let's just open a different 3S Max version with V-Ray 6, render the same scene and see how long that takes and how the result will look like. So now I opened the previous Max version with V-Ray 6. You can see there's just a standard light source in this light in here. It doesn't support those luminaire lights. Now let's just make a rendering and see how fast this will go and how the result will be. So interestingly, the render time is exactly the same, also one minute and three seconds. So it didn't change anything in terms of rendering speed, but let's compare the quality of both of those pictures. So here on the left hand side, we have V-Ray 6 with the traditional V-Ray lights. And on the right hand side, we use the new luminaire lights in V-Ray 7. And even though both images here rendered exactly the same time, you can see there's a very drastic quality difference in terms of noise. So if I go inside here, you can see the one with the traditional lights just much more noisy compared to the one with the luminaire lights. But then on the other hand, I feel that the traditional lights, they have a bit more detail, as you can see, a bit more pronounced and crisper shadows. And also here on these parts of the light, the luminaire lights, they have kind of like lost a lot of the detail and brightness in here. So it remains for me at least kind of a trade-off to choose like which one you would prefer in your specific scenario. And another downside is that those luminaire lights, they only work at the moment with the Cosmos assets. You can't really create them by yourself. Nonetheless, I think it's an interesting approach to see how you can get more higher render quality with hopefully less render time. And I think this can be quite beneficial in many scenarios. So another update has been made to the V-Ray Sky model. If you now select the Sky model, there's new access here to this PRG Clear Sky new model. Once you use this, you have now access for this turbidity and altitude parameters. I assume later on this will be just merged all in this PRG Clear Sky model. But for now, for the beta, this is split up in these two distinctive models. And with the turbidity, you have access to how blue your sky appears, how much particles are in the sky. So if I go lower with this, 
you can make your sky appear much more blue and that's a feature that many people requested. They had difficulties to get the sky very, very blue looking. And at the same time, you can also go up. Let's increase this here to five. You can see we have much more of this yellowish tinting. The blue colors get a little bit more desaturated. And it just looks like, let's say, a desert sky or some sky that has a lot of particles inside. And then there's also this altitude adjustment. And I think the idea is that, for example, if you have a scene where you are in the sky much higher up, you can try to make it look more correct by this because you're not placed on the ground level. So in this scene here, for example, if I increase increase this altitude it will just shift the whole sky here down you can see it just becomes more and more blue because like this kind of halo that's around the sun is just shifted down let's just move that even a bit more and i think you can kind of get the idea of what this here exactly does also the V-Ray Sun you can now place below the horizon and will still kind of illuminate your sky. So this is called the nautical twilight effect. And you can do this up to 12 degrees below the horizon and you still kind of get like a realistic resemblance here of the sky, even though the sun is not really visible in the scene anymore. There's also something that many people are excited about and that is a new Firefly removal algorithm which is integrated for now in the V-Ray 7 CPU rendering mode and only in the bucket type. And then you can find this here in the bucket image sampler under Firefly removal. You have this kind of option and you can tweak those settings to get different kind of effects. But I just want to show you how the result basically would look like. So here I built a simple test scene where I have some fireflies showing up. You can see we have these kind of like super bright pixels here, which look very, very noisy compared to the rest because they would require a lot of sampling. And also you just have these kind of like individual super bright pixels showing up somewhere. And it's something that's really annoying and difficult to clean up with traditional sampling. So here's where this new Firefly removal algorithm comes into place. Let's just zoom inside here. For example, we have all of those Fireflies here and here. And here on the left hand side, that would be the rendering with the Firefly removal algorithm. You can see this looks much nicer, much more clean. We don't really have these super bright pixels anymore. And overall, a just much better appearance. Let's also do this here. So this is how it was before. And then with the Firefly removal algorithm, just check here, for example, all of those super bright pixels get removed. And I think that's is really quite a nice addition to V-Ray 7. And it's definitely something that lots of people can benefit of. So here I have a scene that uses caustics and currently we're in CPU rendering mode. But the new thing about V-Ray 7 is that you can also use the GPU now to render caustics. Let's first render this in CPU and see what kind of result we will get. And then we can try to compare it. So it first needs to calculate a photo map, which will take one minute on the CPU for the scene. I will just speed up the whole procedure. And then the whole rendering in total took three minutes and 40 seconds. So now I switch the scene here to GPU. And in the settings tab, you can see there's now this option to have caustics. And for now, this only works in IPR mode seems. So let me just try to start a new rendering. And now the photo map is calculated on the GPU. It goes really fast, just a few seconds. So now we see our GPU rendering and this one here would be our CPU rendering. You can see they don't look quite exactly the same because it's just different how both engines handle, for example, here, this water shader and so on. But let's focus mainly on the caustics. And you can see, especially here for those reflective caustics, that with the GPU version here, they just render much more crisp, much more sharp, have more detail. You can more clearly understand the shape. And additionally, they just render so much faster. So I think that's quite a nice addition now to V-Ray GPU that caustics are also renderable in there now and you don't have to use CPU rendering for those anymore. So there's also some changes to Chaos Scatter. Here the whole scene uses Chaos Scatter for the grass, for example. And now you have access to some predefined pattern that's similar like in Forest Pack where you just have some predefined textures. For example, let's use this one in here. And you can see a preview in here. And then this is how it would look with your Chaos Scatter in the scene. Let's choose another one, for example, this one. And it just creates these random clumps of grass in here. And let's choose another one, for example, these lines. 
And then you can see it can be quite helpful to use these kind of patterns in order to just achieve certain kind of effects. So there's also a new brush mode where you can draw here the instances directly on the surface. And for this, you have to use the edit instance mode. And you can see as soon as we do this, this will change here the preview of those instances. Because now if we go into the brush mode and we start to paint, you can see that the ones that we draw with a brush, they look slightly different. And that's just easier to differentiate basically the ones that we drew here with a brush and the ones that are based on those patterns in here. And like this, you can further define or further customize here your grass or the chaos scatter object. There's also an erase option. So you can erase, let's say those ones that we painted in here. And here's also where it's quite handy that those are shaded slightly differently in the viewport because you can choose to only erase the brushed instances, which I have enabled at the moment. Or if you disable this, then you can also remove the instances here which we generated here using those patterns like this i think you can quite nicely customize exactly the look that you want to achieve additionally there have been some changes under the hood for example if you want to export this here as a v-ray scene or you want to upload this to chaos cloud this now in the latest version apparently will go much faster compared to how it was before so lastly, now in 3ds Max, you have access to the V-Ray Profiler. And before this was available in Maya only, but now in 3ds Max, that also comes over. And this you can enable here in the Settings tab. And the idea is that if you render your image, so let's just render this now, then we'll analyze which parts of the image took how long time to render and what the rendering time was used for. So let's open here the settings again. And if you click this open profile folder, it will open a document in your browser, which then looks like this. I think it's maybe not the most beautiful representation, but it gets the job done. So here from left to right, you can see the rendering time. In this case, it took 22 seconds to render the scene. And you can then zoom in and see, for example, here this purple bar. This would be the shader of my shading dummy. And then it breaks that down that 20% of the time was used for GI calculation, 53% of the time was used for reflection and so on. You can do this for different elements here in your scene and try to understand what causes, for example, excessive render times. If you're not really sure why your scene renders a long time, you can check which elements are responsible for that and then try to tweak those. So there you have it. Those, in my opinion, would be the most interesting features that will come to V-Ray 7. If you want to try out the beta, as I said, you can do that by yourself and give the developers some feedback. And if you want to support my channel, you can check out my Patreon where you can get access to all of my scene files and also watch a whole course on car rendering and find lots of other additional goodies. So check that out if that's interesting for you. Otherwise, see you next tutorial. Take care and see you soon.